There's a little notes page for kids that was on the table uh, on the way in uh, this morning. I hope you follow along. Uh, so Ephesians, we're going to uh, wrap up this morning our uh, time in Ephesians. It's been a couple of months or so, three or four months. Uh, Ephesians 6 this morning, and we're picking up at verse 18 down to verse number 20. Uh, but just notice again here that the context is verse 10, very familiar passage uh, in Paul's writings when he says, finally, so after all that he's just written, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore. Notice that multiple times. Stand. Having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then here's our text this morning where we left off last Sunday. Praying, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And to all these words, God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, everybody's amped up these days, right? Everyone's amped up. Everyone's ramping up for November. We all can't wait. Amen? <laughs> everybody's ramped up, right? Uh, our former president survived an assassination. We know this, uh, right, a week and, and a day ago. Uh, and all Americans should give thanks to God, no matter where we stand, uh, that he is alive. Uh, the R's just had their, uh, their convention uh, with one of the great heroes of my youth, uh, Hulk Hogan, tearing his shirt off, right? Probably saw that. Uh, uh, not, how can you not feel like an American, you know, just an American joy you know, when Hulk Hogan shows up uh, at a convention tearing off his shirt like the old days? Uh, the D's are having their uh, convention uh, very soon as well. Uh, meanwhile, in the state, uh, known as the quote-unquote golden state, our dollars are worth uh, less than fool's gold uh, these days, right? And uh, we, we, we keep seeing laws passed that boggle uh, some of our minds. Uh, I had a great question last week about all this, right? How, how are we as Christians to navigate uh, all this stuff? We're here in this text about spiritual war. How should we navigate uh, stuff out there, right? We're here, but what about the world that we live in, politics and the Christian uh, as Christians who are citizens of uh, this great country, I clearly could say to you and uh, will, will say to you uh, to vote, to campaign, to donate, put up a lawn sign, uh, make calls for your favorite candidate, even run for office. Uh, I mentioned last uh, Sunday to someone that the founder of, uh, uh, of our particular little strand of the Dutch Reformed uh, Church, Abraham Kuyper, was the prime minister of the Netherlands. And so if there's any uh, if there's any Christian tradition that believes that Christians can serve as politicians, uh, surely it is us. And so uh, all this is good. All this is right for the welfare of our cities, our counties, our states, uh, and our nation. Uh, but, but we're here this morning because I'm called to preach the gospel uh, to you. I'm called to preach the word to you. Uh, I'm called to preach to you the law, what God commands, what God requires of you. I'm called to preach the gospel to you, what God has accomplished for you already in Jesus Christ. And and so when we come together uh, as a body of Christians, as a church, we assemble together from all the various neighborhoods and houses and apartments and places that we live, in which we're bombarded every single day of the week with all kinds of stuff, and all kinds of noise, all kinds of chaos out there in the world. But we come here to get a little foretaste of heaven. We come here to get a little taste of what, what's awaiting us. Right? The world is just a rat race, but we come in here to have some rest. Right? We hear all kinds of noise out there, but we come here to hear God speak to us. And so I believe it's my calling to minister to you this eternal rest so that you get a, a little bit of respite from the insanity of a world opposed 
to God. And so to do that, we turn to the Word. We turn to the Word. And we've reached the end of Paul's letter to the church or churches in Ephesus, the Ephesians, as it's called. Uh, And he began this letter proclaiming to those Christians back in the first century and to us uh, that we already have every single spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Is there anything that you need still to be satisfied and complete in Jesus Christ? That wasn't very convincing. Do you have everything you need, loved ones? Has Jesus Christ paid it all? Has he given you the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you with all you need? Yes. And so Paul said at the very beginning of the letter when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's already blessed us in the heavenly places with every single spiritual blessing in Christ. That's how he began the letter. And for three chapters he explained what it means to be blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So go back and read chapters 1, 2, and 3. That's what it's all about. What does it mean that you're a Christian who's been blessed by God with every spiritual blessing? The last three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, it's all about, okay, now how do you live a life down here on earth that is worthy of the heavenly calling those heavenly spiritual blessings that God has already given to you. How do you do that? And we've seen that for the last three chapters, so go back and read chapters 4, 5, and 6. How am I to live as a blessed believer in Jesus in this world, in this life, in light of my heavenly calling? And so as those blessed with every spiritual blessing, we are engaged now, he says, at the very end of this chapter, the very end of the letter, We are engaged as those blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We are engaged in spiritual war. And we have many enemies. The world and its antichrist influence. Our flesh, meaning our sinful desires. The devil and his insidious strategies. And they hate God. They hate Jesus. They hate you. You're blessed with everything. You need nothing more. You vote for Trump, you vote for Biden, that's not going to add one iota to your spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. Vote for whomever you want. That does not add anything to your Christianity. And the world hates that because we stand complete in Christ. We don't need these parties. We don't need all the chaos and the insanity of our world. We have Christ. That's all we need. He's given us everything. And because they hate the God, they hate Christ, they hate us, they hate the church, they fight against us, they war against us. And so Paul says, you are blessed, and now you've got to fight. You are at rest in Jesus Christ, now you've got to get active. Right? There's, that's the irony of the Christian life. We are at rest in Christ, yet we have to fight. We stand secure in Christ. He tells us multiple times to stand. But you've got to engage. You got to fight. We engage in the spiritual war, as Paul describes here, as I just read, by putting on this armor of God. And I mentioned last Sunday that the armor of God, right? It's it's God's armor. The armor of God. It's God's. It belongs to Him. In the Old Testament, the Messiah, the promised Savior, was described as wearing all these pieces of armor. He was coming to this world as a warrior to fight. And now we are told, because we believe in Jesus, who is that warrior par excellence, now we are to take up his armor and put it onto ourselves. We can't just let the armor, as I mentioned, that, there's that quote last Sunday uh, afternoon, I think it was, Sunday afternoon, I quoted a, a little line from John Calvin where, where Calvin says, you know, it's not enough for us to see sort of in a closet this nice shiny uh, armor, it's all polished up and it just looks nice and it looks like it belongs in a museum somewhere. It's not enough for us to look at it and to see it and to keep it shiny. We've got to take it on off the, off the coat rack and put it on. You've got to wear it. And so he, he tells us to fight. He tells us to put on the spiritual armor of God. And then he ends his exhortation to fight in the armor of God by telling us in verse 18 to fervently pray in the Spirit. That's where we pick up this morning. Fervently pray in the Spirit. So let's listen to what the Holy Spirit has uh, to say to us 
uh, today. So after we take up the armor of God, it's defensive pieces and uh, the offensive weapon of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul says, praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. That seems like a strange transition, doesn't it? Like, fight. Take up a sword and, and hack to pieces the world of flesh, the devil. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. How is prayer a weapon? How is prayer a weapon? I mean, a sword, I can understand. You can hold it. You can sharpen it. You can actually use it. The gladius was this little two-edged sword that you could hack both ways and you could also stab. But prayer, right? You can't really hold prayer. You can't really see prayer. You can't really sharpen prayer. You can't really uh, wield prayer. But it's a weapon, he says. How? Well, again, think of the Roman legionnaire, the Roman soldier. All the armor, he's got the gladius, he's got the sword. Uh, and, but as they would go out into war, they would chant. There were war songs. There were songs to boost morale. There were songs to remind them of their marching orders and whom they served. There were songs that were meant to be prayers to their gods for protection and for, and for power. So they were, they were singing, uh, they were praying, they were chanting, they were reciting in various cadences these prayers from their souls to their gods. But Paul makes a distinction here, doesn't he, with the Christian soldier. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. It's not praying from your spirit. It's not praying to your brother, fellow soldier, sister next to you, to their spirit. And they, no, this is praying in the spirit. Who's the spirit there? The Holy Spirit. How do we know that? How do we know that? Look at the, look at the context. The, the, the immediate verse that is just before, verse 18, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And lo and behold, Paul wrote this letter uh, to the church in Ephesus. Uh, their missionary pastor was young Timothy. And so in 1 Timothy 1, Paul reminds Timothy to stay in Ephesus, this very congregation, to stay there. And then in 2 Timothy 3, when Paul is writing his last letter, we read his very famous words, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. Who's the breath of God in scripture? The Holy Spirit. So the scriptures are the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. The Word of God is the sword of the Holy Spirit because they are inspired by Him. And Paul then calls us to pray in the Spirit. In other words, it's not prayer that originates from us merely, but it comes from Him. It comes from the Spirit. So what does it mean to pray in the Spirit, to pray in the Holy Spirit? It means to pray under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Just as the, the, the Word was inspired by the influence of the Holy Spirit, so to our prayer is to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Romans 8 to see this. Romans 8, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. Uh, somewhat familiar passage. I'll just quickly glance down from verse 18 where Paul says that the age in which we live in is one characterized by suffering. Do you see that in verse 18? Romans 8, verse 18. This age is characterized by sufferings. Therefore, verse 22, he says, the creation which has been subjected to futility because of Adam's original sin, the creation is groaning out for liberation from its sufferings, right? Creation is described here, it's being personified as a person, right? So creation itself doesn't literally groan, doesn't, doesn't literally have birth pangs, but it's described that way. Creation's groaning to be liberated. Notice verse 23, we also are groaning in this age of suffering. We want our bodies to be liberated, our bodies to be redeemed. We're tired of being frail and fallen and futile. Lord, redeem us. You've raised up Jesus. Raise us up. We're longing for that. But then notice verse 26. So, an age of sufferings, creation's groaning, the believer is groaning, but notice this, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What's the weakness? Notice. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We should know as Christians, as spiritual Christians, what to pray for, but we don't. We're weak. 
Notice the contrast then. But, right? We are weak. We are forgetful. We are unmindful. We are unspiritual. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings. The creation groans. The believer groans. The Spirit mysteriously groans with groanings. Too deep for words. In other words, Paul is saying that when we come to the end of ourselves in prayer, we've only just begun to come to the beginning of who God is. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. The Spirit groans and intercedes for us and in us and through us. Meaning, as Paul says, praying in the Spirit. This is Prayer is guided by the Spirit. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is moved by the Holy Spirit. It's influenced by the Holy Spirit. It comes from Him. Well, why do I need to pray in the Spirit? Back to our text. Why do I need to pray in the Spirit? Verse 18. Because he's, he's been telling us that we've got a great spiritual enemy. You've got a great spiritual foe. Back in chapter 1, verse 21 of Ephesians, uh, Paul said Jesus was raised up, right, the resurrection, and he was raised up far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, above every name that is named, not just in this age, but also in the age to come. And so Jesus Christ is king, but these spiritual enemies, these spiritual foes are still called rulers, authorities, powers, dominions. Right? They're serious foes. Go back to what I said last Sunday. The spiritual realm is just as real as the realm that you can see, touch, taste, smell, and experience. There is a real spiritual realm that you can't see, but it's there. And although Christ has conquered, this realm still exists, and they hate you. Chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said that you, believer, you once in your unbelief walked in trespasses, you walked, you lived your life in sin, you followed the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? The spirit who is, at now, uh, who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a spiritual foe. And here in the context of chapter 6, verse 18, we read in chapter 6, verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If you're an R, your you're wrestling is not against the Ds. If you're a D, it's not against the Rs. And if you don't care, it's not against either of them. Your, your wrestling is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I are called to pray in the Spirit. This means to pray under the Spirit's influence, just as the word was inspired under his influence, so too our prayer must be inspired, as it were, under his influence. And where do we find this influence of the Holy Spirit to guide us in our prayer? Where do we find this influence of the Holy Spirit in our prayer, brothers and sisters? In the word. In the word. The spirit-inspired word that then guides us, influences us in our prayer. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit. Notice the connection between the two. I'll come back to that. Now, as we pray under the Spirit's influence, we're also to pray in four ways according to verse 18. Uh, here we see prevailing prayer, victorious prayer against the schemes of the devil, against his minions, against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers, the present, evil, uh, the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. Here is prayer that actually works. Here is prayer that wins. Here's prevailing prayer. First, prevailing or victorious prayer means praying at all times. That means regular intervals, loved ones. In the Old Testament, there was daily sacrifices every morning and every evening. And when, you, and when the priest would offer up the animal sacrifice, they would pray in the morning, and they would do so in the evening. That became a pattern for the, for the, for the life of the believer, to pray every morning, to pray every evening. At least, at minimum, every morning, every evening. The Psalms later on say, Lord, I pray to you every morning, every noon, and every evening, three times a day. The Psalms even tell us that we are to praise God and to pray to Him seven times. Psalm 119, verse 164, seven times a day I praise Thee. 
So you see, it's good and it's, it's a godly thing for us to, to set aside certain times every single day. Now, we're busy, but we're not too busy to pray, are we? I mentioned a couple of Sundays ago, every morning when you wake up, what should you be saying to yourself? I am baptized. And we say, Lord, I am baptized. I belong to Jesus Christ. Give him thanks for the rest of the night that you had the night before, safety the night before. Ask his blessing on the day. Lord, I'm baptized. I belong to you. Here I am. Here I am. Let me serve. Pray Thanksgiving before every meal. Right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever. Pray. Give, give thanks. Everything is sanctified by the word of God in prayer, Paul tells us. Pray before going to bed, right? These are the easy ways, the easy set times in our daily life that we should be praying at all times. But praying at all times also means praying in good times and bad, sickness and health, joy and sorrow, right? It's all times. Or let's think of it like this. How many of us have a cell phone? How many of us have notifications? on our cell phones, right? Let's check. I've got one X, one DoorDash, and a couple of texts. <laughs> DoorDash is not for me, by the way. It's for a certain someone in Virginia who's always hungry, a big kid. So if you get, te- if you get notifications that are pinging on your phone or just are notifying you of something, I mean, shouldn't we be, quote unquote, notifying God more than our looking at our phones all the time come on i'm guilty of this i'm guilty of this praying at all times praying at all times secondly prevailing prayer means with all prayer and supplication he tells us there Uh, there are various kinds various forms of prayer adoration confession intercession for others thanksgiving supplications for needs and so when he says there to pray with all prayer and supplication. For example, when the devil tempts you to feel like you're God and that you're the center of your own universe, pray adoration to God instead. When the devil wants you to have a big head and think of yourself more highly than you ought, Lord, I worship you. I praise you. You're the only God, not me. When the devil tempts you to look at your own sins and to doubt that your sins are forgiven and that you can stand before God holy and acceptable to him, Pray in confession of your sins. Yes, I'm a sinner, devil. What of it? But Jesus Christ is satisfied for all my sins. You confess your sins and you pray, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me in Jesus Christ. That's the easiest way to get rid of the devil's temptation of feeling, feeling like a scum of the earth who does not deserve salvation. You take your sins and you throw them back to the devil and tell him, take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. Don't tell me about this. I know know this. He knows this. And he already came for me. When the devil tempts you with with a woe is me kind of an attitude, intercede for someone else. Get your mind off yourself. Pray for someone else. Intercession. When the devil tempts you with depression and even despair, give thanks. Pray thanksgiving to the Lord, right? Again, when, you, when we pray outside of ourselves, it gets us off of ourselves and onto the many, many blessings, every spiritual blessing we already have in Jesus Christ. When the devil tempts you with that life is impossible, you, suppl- you pray supplication for your deepest needs. Lord, it feels impossible. Lord, it feels tough. Lord, it feels like I can't make it. Lord, I feel like I want to quit. Supp- that's supplication. Lord, help me. Help me. So prevailing prayer. It also means keep alert with all perseverance, he says. Notice the, right, the, the all, all these little, little prevailing prayer, the ways of prayer have all attached to them. All perseverance, meaning pray with watchfulness. Jesus taught his disciples to pray with watchfulness for the coming destruction of Jerusalem, but also the end of all things. Luke 21, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day may come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place to stand before the Son of Man. Be watchful for the Lord's coming in prayer. Be watchful. 
Keep alert, Paul says, with all perseverance. And didn't Jesus on the night of his uh, betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he teach his disciples to be watchful about their own temptations? Be watchful about your own temptation. Be aware of your surroundings. Who's around you? What's, what's around you? Where are you? What are you listening to? What do you see? Be aware. Jesus told his disciples to remain here and watch. And then he went off and he prayed. But when he came back, he found them sleeping. And he said, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Watch and pray. There was one uh, 17th century uh, Dutch theologian uh, who, who wrote about this. His name is Wilhelmus Abrakel, and uh, he says uh, one of the schemes of the devil is against prayer. One of his schemes is against prayer. How? The devil uses all the activities of our lives, what Jesus calls the cares of this world, to tempt us to crowd out our calendars so that we don't have time to pray. He tempts us by making us think prayer is too difficult. He tempts us to think that our prayers are ineffective and fruitless. We can think to ourselves after we pray, I didn't pray with enough faith that time. We can think the devil's thoughts, you didn't really mean that, did you? How can God use that prayer? God is going to do whatever he wants. Why pray in the first place? We've all thought that, haven't we? God already knows. God's so powerful. God's all-knowing. God's all-wise. God's almighty. Why even pray in the first place? That's the devil's temptation whispering to you. He tempts us while we're praying even by diverting our attention to everything else. Right? Sort of spiritual ADHD. Right? We have a kid with ADHD, so we know what that's like. All of us have spiritual ADHD. We pray and our mind is, what time do I, what time do I have to wake up in the morning? Did I remember to get milk on the grocery list? Who's winning the big game, right? During times of prayer. The devil tempts us not to pray. Fourth, prevailing prayer means making supplication for all the saints. Recall how Ephesians is all about unity uh, in the body of Christ. Jesus died for Jews and Gentiles, didn't he? He toppled what? Between Jews and Gentiles. There's something between them that Paul said in Ephesians 2. There's a wall of hostility, and Christ has toppled that wall. And so he's taken two and he's made one new man, we were told, back in chapter 2. And together that one new man is a dwelling place of God, of the Spirit. We are a temple and dwell with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, pray for one another. Pray for those that you know. Pray for those that you don't even know yet. Pray for all the saints. So, loved ones, under the influence and the power of the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, you've been supplied with all you need to prevail via prayer, through prayer, over the devil and over all of his wicked spiritual forces. Do you believe that? He's already given you everything you need. So simply pray. And as we're engaged in spiritual warfare, as we're praying under the Holy Spirit's influence through the word that he's inspired, and as we're doing this, we prevail over the devil. And then notice verses 19 to 20 quickly. Paul particularly pray or asks for them to pray for him. Praying for bold preaching. Notice he says, pray for all the saints and, and also for me. So he, he, he singles himself out, right? And there's an important lesson here for us. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, right? the revealed truth of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, because he was in prison when he wrote this letter, that I may declare it boldly, boldly, as I ought to speak. So notice again then, notice again there, the connection between spiritual warfare, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. Okay? 
your spiritual warfare, the Spirit of God, and prayer. Notice the connection. What is the connection? If you as a Christian are engaged in spiritual warfare, how much more so are your unbelieving family and friends who are dead in trespasses and sin, who are walking. Paul said of us, we once walked, but our unbelieving loved ones and friends who are, present tense, walking in trespasses and sins, who are following the course of this world, who are, present tense, following the prince of the power of the air. If life is hard for us as Christians who have everything that we already need in Christ, yet we still have to fight, how much more so for the unbeliever? And so how do those dead people come alive? How do those who are walking that way according to the world come and walk this way after Christ? How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. And how does the Holy Spirit bring them to life? The Word. The Gospel. How do people who are following the power of the air, the prince of the power of the air, People who are following the devil. How do they change course and follow the Lord, Jesus Christ? It's that they hear the gospel. They hear the gospel. Jesus resurrects sinners, just like he resurrected you, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. Amen? God saves, but he also saves through the means of preaching. We don't just pray, Lord, save my son. Save my backslidden daughter. Save my neighbor. We don't just pray that. We also do something about it, don't we? And if we can't ourselves do something about it, Lord, put a Christian in that person's way. Lord, make them wake up and feel something was wrong and go to church. Lord, prepare that that pastor, that church that I sent them to, to preach the gospel. How are the dead to come alive? By the power of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the power of the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. One hymn writer said it like this, Our eyes have caught the vision of a world that's lost in sin. And the precious sheaves for Jesus, we may help to gather in. Let us plead His loving promises and thus the victory win. Yes, let's prevail in prayer. Are you feeling dead spiritually today? Do you sense there's something wrong with the way that you're walking down the road of life? Perhaps you have some intuition today that there are forces beyond your control that are somehow exerting influence and power over your life. If that's you, the answer is to stop and to come to Jesus. Stop and come to Jesus. He saves sinners. He saves sinners. Paul Paul himself was an absolute sinner. And those he's writing to were, were just heinous, wicked sinners. He saves sinners. He saves those who cannot save themselves. He saves those who are dead. He makes them alive. He saves those who are walking down the wrong path of life on on a path of destruction. And he rescues. He rescues. Stop what you're doing and come to Jesus. Come and believe in him today. So brothers and sisters, pray. Pray for the bold preaching of the gospel from this pulpit, no matter who stands in this place. May OURC ever be known as a church where no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what text of Scripture we just happen to be in that Sunday, the good news that Jesus saves sinners will be proclaimed each and every time you show up. And every time you invite an unsaved loved one, you invite a co-worker and a neighbor, I want you to be confident that you can tell them to come because they're going to hear about Jesus. Are you with me in that? 
Now, I mentioned a Dutch Reformed guy. I've got to mention a Baptist, okay? So, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon once said like this in one of his sermons. He said, we preach Christ crucified, and every sermon shakes the gates of hell. We bring sinners to Jesus by the Spirit's power, and every convert is a stone torn down from the wall of Satan's mighty castle. Any one of us, not just preachers, but any one of us, is made useful in saving souls. We do, as it were, repeat the bruising of the serpent's head. When we, by preaching the gospel, turn sinners from the air of their ways so that they escape from the power of darkness, again we bruise the serpent's head. Whenever in any shape or way you are blessed in the aiding of the cause of truth and righteousness in the world, you too tread upon the serpent's head. And so we've made it to the end. We've come to the end of yet another book of the Bible. Ephesians began proclaiming to us that we already have every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. Got it all. It's all yours. And it ends with those who are blessed with every spiritual blessing being engaged in spiritual warfare. Pray in reliance on and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Pray prevailing prayer, victorious prayer at all times, with all prayer and supplication, with all perseverance and for all the saints. Pray for the bold preaching of the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers. We ask that you would answer us. We ask that you would give us victory over the world, the flesh, the devil. And Lord, we pray that all those that we love and care about, all those that we've invited to church, all those, Lord, who've rejected our invitations, who've rejected our attempts to give an answer for the reason why we believe, all those who don't care, all those who've backslidden, all those who've fallen away, all those who've rejected, all those who are ambivalent, all those who just don't care, uh, one bit about spiritual things, Lord, would you save them? And use us, Lord, in that. Use us. In our prayers, in our seeking to be godly in front of them, to be a good witness, in our words that we speak, and especially, Lord, as we, we seek to bring people to come to hear and to sit underneath uh, the word, uh, may your gospel, may the power of your Holy Spirit give new life Save sinners, we pray in this place. Add to us daily those who are being saved. May we see the joyful uh, sight of sinners calling upon Jesus' name, being baptized and following after Jesus. And Lord, as we pray that prayer, we also come as believers who are constantly struggling with our sins, our doubts, our worries, our lack of prayer. And so meet us, we pray, at the Lord's table with the very body and blood of Christ to assure us that we are forgiven that we do belong to Jesus Christ, that we have every spiritual blessing in Him, and send us out empowered to pray and to do so boldly. And we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful and precious name, and together all of God's people say, Amen. Let's uh, turn together in our hymn.